Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for this Animode short lesson. This lesson will cover the Old Testament card, Circumcision, and which will find its fulfillment in the New Testament card, Baptism. And we will be covering particularly the Article 10, which is the forgiveness of sins and how we have the forgiveness of sins. But let's first um, just think about the 6,000 years since the time of creation and split that up into three categories. So the, for the first 2,000 years, you just had uh, the people, the nations. This would be, in the Animode series, this would be um, Adam and Noah. But then we reach the 2,000 year mark. So we're about a third of the way through and we have Abraham. And there is going to be a, a covenant that God makes with Abraham to set him and his descendants aside. That covenant will be circumcision. Um, circumcision done with Abraham by the command of God is going to basically set aside these people, the descendants of Abraham, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, set them aside from all the other nations. And so there will be now the Jews, the chosen people, the Israelites, and then the Gentiles, the other nations. And so there are two categories basically on the face of the earth. There are the chosen people, and then there are the Gentiles, the nations. And so with this, we want to, I want to just stress that circumcision as a covenant is very exclusive um, to one group of people, the descendants of Abraham, and anyone that wants to join that group but must join through circumcision. Also, circumcision is for the males only because it is the male body part that is being circumcised. Um, and so this is for the male, it's for the Jew, it sets them aside as a, as a chosen people, as a chosen race, um, a covenant with God. And then it has a permanent mark on the body. And so it, it puts a, it's a permanent mark of kind of uh, interior reality, a covenant with God, but a permanent mark on the body. So it affects, of course, the body and the soul in the sense the soul is separated for God alone. And then we will go for 2,000 more years until we get to 4,000 years after creation, which is the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then what do we have? Our Lord will institute this sacrament of baptism when he says to his apostles, go out to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so now we have a new covenant and the old um, practice, the old rite of circumcision now makes way for the new and baptism now fulfills circumcision. So what does baptism then do for us and, and, and how does that change everything now? Um, remember, this is now 4,000 years in. So we've had 2,000 years with no covenant, no sign. And then from 2,000 to 4,000, we had circumcision, distinguishing the Jew from the Gentile. And then from 4,000 until now, um, that, that this now this third part of, of this, this history or this timeline, we have baptism. Baptism will make a distinction between, really now the distinction is not between Jew and Gentile, but between those that are baptized and those that are unbaptized, those that belong to the church and those that are outside the church. Um, baptism, of course, is not just for males alone, but it's for male and female. And, of course, baptism is for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike. And so a Jew can be baptized. Anyone can be baptized, male, female, any land, any race, any um, economic group, anyone can be baptized. And what does baptism do? It sets a person aside. It sets them aside as being a part of the body of Christ, the church. Um, and we'll talk about all the different um, effects of this or the, or the fruits of this. And then it also makes a permanent mark on the soul. So just as circumcision had a permanent mark on the body of a male only, now baptism will make a permanent mark on the soul of any person that's baptized, male or female, Jew or Gentile. They will now become a new creation, permanent, indelible mark or character of the sacrament on their soul, saying that they are now a changed person. They are now uh, born again, regenerated. We see here, we're gonna look at three columns here. In the first column, we're gonna look at that blue house that we've been talking about, God, grace, and life. Um, and this is where we start. This is a good place that we start. We'll talk about the good news and bad news. This is good news that we have our friends with God, that we have sanctifying grace, and we have a right to heaven. Let's just cover these three things and, and how amazing that is. 
that God, who is our creator, creates us out of love and wants us to share in his very life, he calls us his friends. We walk with God. Adam and Eve walk with God in the garden. This is what Adam and Eve experienced. They experienced that sanctifying grace in their soul, that very partaking in the very life of God, which would prepare them and get them ready for um, being in, sharing in the Trinity for all eternity. Um, and then we have, they have the right to heaven. What does that mean, the right to heaven? That means that they will eventually share in the beatific vision. So they are friends with God. They have his very life within them, and they will share in that life forever in heaven. They at least have a right to that. This is what Adam and Eve, um, some of the graces that Adam and Eve had at the beginning. Adam and Eve also had an intellect, a will, and passion that were all working together, which is what we call integrity. And so if you think about the intellect, that they were thinking well, their will, that they were acting well, and that their passions were ruled correctly. They weren't unruly, but that their passions were integral. So that means that if they knew something was right, then they would have the courage to do it, and their passions wouldn't get them off course. So having the intellect and the will and the passions all working together, you can think of the analogy of a chariot, where you have the driver, the reins, and the horses all working completely, perfectly together, integrated, and how wonderful that is. That is what Adam and Eve experienced, thinking well, doing well. Their passions, their feelings were under control, under the intellect and under the will, under that right reason and that courage, this integrity they enjoyed. It, were, it was all of these things, and we'll talk about a few more here, that they were given to God. God gave these things to them, and particularly Adam, as the father of the human race, were to pass those on. They also had no suffering, no labor, no death. And when I mean death here, no physical death or spiritual death. Remember, they were friends with God and had sanctifying grace and a right to heaven. So no spiritual death at all. They also would not die physically. Um, what I mean labor here, it's, it's not that there wasn't work because work is a good thing, but not the labor that we know, not the pain and the toil, um, not the um, frustration with bringing forth fruit from the earth and things like that. That's going to be a punishment later on. Um, and then they did not have the suffering, which is kind of what I mentioned here. Now, if we look at this list in this first column, this is what Adam and Eve, our first parents, enjoyed. This is what God gave to Adam to give to us. So think of um, how important this is, that, that God said to Adam, you are the custodian, you are the Lord of all these things. And as the rightful Lord or custodian, I want you to keep these safe for yourself and your bride, Eve, and I want you to pass them on to your children. Um, so the way you can kind of think of this is if a grandfather were to give something to his son to give to the grandkids. So let's say that the grandfather were to give um, 10 acres of land. Let's say there's five grandchildren, for instance. And the grandfather comes to his son and says, I want you, I'm giving you 10 acres of land, and I want you to give two acres to each of my grandchildren. Um, because they're not old enough yet for me to give it to them myself. So I will give it to you. You are the dominion. You have the dominion over this, the custody over this. You will pass it down to the grandkids. Well, let's say the father um, does not take care of that land, um, that gift. Let's say the, the, the father squanders that gift that the grandfather has given, and so then nothing is left for the grandkids. Um, this is not the fault of the grandkids, of course. Um, this would be the fault of the father who did not pass these things on. This is where we, um, this is what happened to Adam. Adam was given all of these things as the father of the human race, and as the father, as the custodian, having lordship over these things, um, giving these wonderful gifts by God, he was to pass them on, and he did not. Um, we're going to look in the next column how that happened, um, but the, the quick answer is through original sin. And it's that original sin which moves us into the bad news. And so we have the first column is the good news. The good news, but then now we're going to move into the bad news. The bad news is that all those great graces in the first column were not passed on. And instead, Satan, sin, and death now have the dominion. They now have the dominion. So what does that do? It changes everything. Now instead of being friends, we're at enmity with God. We lose sanctifying grace and we lose our right to heaven. Now, of course, we still can have actual grace, and we know from, the, from, from Jesus' own words that those that 
were right with God would go to Abraham's bosom. So, but the reality is each person that comes into this world will have this enmity with God, a, a kind of concupiscence to go against God, um, that they will not have sanctifying grace at all, um, a grace that makes them right with God, and, and they have lost the right to heaven. Um, that loss of heaven is very uh, drastic because even for good people like Noah and David and Moses and, and Abraham, uh, they cannot, let me repeat that, they cannot be in the beatific vision. They will not be for all eternity with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The best that they can do is be in a, a place of peace, the place of the dead, um, which Jesus calls Abraham's bosom, or, or it was called Sheol. Um, so it was a place where the just people went, but that's the best that they could do because heaven was lost, heaven was closed. Um, so along those lines, even though people could not have sanctifying grace, they could not have the very grace of God dwelling within them, which is what we believe we can have now through Christ and his church. But they did have actual grace. They did have the assistance of God the, um, the, and that they could act in accordance with that assistance, which is what we call actual grace. Um, and they could, of course, battle that enmity with God and, and um, battle that concupiscence. It, it's going to now be a struggle we will not have sanctifying grace, and we will never get to heaven. And we have to work really, really hard to be right with God, friends with God. Um, right with God in the sense of having the friendship or, or um, being close to Him. In regards to the intellect, will, and passions, we now have a darkened mind, a weakened will, and unruly passions. So this is what we would really call, instead of integrity, we have concupiscence. Um, not only did Adam revolt against God or rebel against God, but now it's kind of part of our human, our fallen human nature to rebel against God, to have this enmity with God, and to have a darkened mind again, a weakened will and unruly passions. We experience this every single day. Um, our passions get the best of us. I want to wake up early and pray, but yet I st stay in bed and sleep. Um, I want to, um, I know the right thing that I need to do in the intellect, but then I lack the courage to do it. Or for, perhaps I have a lot of courage and desire, um, but I don't have the right direction, the right intellect. And so with this darkened mind, weakened will, and unruly passions, we see that it is very difficult to um, know the truth and to do the good and to um, allow ourselves to not be completely controlled by our feelings and our emotions and our passions. Um, and so this is the state that we find ourselves in. Also, we know that we do suffer, we do labor, we experience death, both physical death and spiritual death. So the status is now we will suffer, now we will labor, we will die. Um, not only will we die physically, which is definitely going to happen to everyone, but there is the danger of a spiritual death, um, and this is kind of two levels, either a spiritual death of the just, which will just be in Abraham's bosom, but never, ever, ever experience heaven, or worse, far worse, would be the spiritual death, which is an eternal death of hell. And so death has now entered in. Satan, sin, and death now have the dominion, and we are constantly having, of course, to battle against this. Um, but at, in this column, we only have actual grace, and the very, very, very best we can do as far as eternity is Abraham's bosom, um, a place of rest, but not the beatific vision. We see in this second column that this is what Adam um, put us in. But we know, as St. Paul says, that through, though death came through one man, life will come through Jesus Christ. And so we have the old Adam, um, the original Adam, that gave us this second column. It'll be Jesus Christ, the new Adam, that will give us this third column. It will be Eve that um, ushered in and worked with Adam for this second column. It will be Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, through her yes, that will co-work with her son to give us this third column. And so we've already talked about the good news, but then the bad news. Well, it doesn't end with that bad news because now we are going to have the good news. And that good news comes through the sacrament of baptism where we have Jesus, grace, and life. We can now move, and this is the true good news, that now we can be friends with God. We can have that sanctifying grace in our soul and now, finally, we have a right to heaven. Um, heaven has now been opened. We see this with the baptism of our Lord, where um, at, when Jesus is baptized, we see that the heavens are opened, that a dove descends upon him, which is the Holy Spirit, 
and we see a voice from the heavens, which is the voice of God the Father. And so there at the baptism of our Lord, we have God the Father, um, whose voice is heard. We have God the Son, who is seen in the water. And then we have God the Holy Spirit, which descends to anoint Jesus. And the good news is that we are now friends with God. We have that sanctifying grace to make us right with God, to justify us. And we now have a right to heaven to live for all eternity, knowing, loving, and serving the Blessed Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The good news gets even better when we talk about the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. These virtues are infused in our soul. So this is kind of like brining chicken, where you have the, um, the sugar and the salt solution in the water. You put the chicken tenders in there, and that uh, sugar and that salt gets deep into the meat. This is what happens, faith, hope, and charity are like this brine for our soul. These virtues of faith, hope, and charity are infused into our soul so that we can truly then battle the darkened, weakened, unruly uh, concupiscence that we have. So yes, we have a darkened intellect that we um, have a hard time finding out the truth, but it is faith, divine revelation, the truths that God gives us, um, particularly, of course, Jesus Christ gives us himself. He is truth himself and his church that he founds, this is the truth, and this is the faith that anchors us and then we hold on to. And then, yes, we have a weakened will. And in that weakened will, we know that we sin, and we know that we struggle to go to heaven, um, but we want, to, of course, to, to go to heaven. And so that weakened will, we have hope. We have hope for the forgiveness of sins. This is why in Article 10 we say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Baptism, of course, first. Confession, of course, after baptism. Um, but I hope, why, why do I have hope? Because I, I know I can have my sins forgiven. And also, why do I have hope? Because I know that I have every single grace I need to get to heaven. And then, this is, I think, the most important, that, or not most important, but, but, but equally as important, is that charity helps me to put my passions in control. Many, many times, we are going to be selfish until we have to love another or until we have to love God. So when we start choosing to love God, and we start choosing to love our neighbor, particularly our family, we become less selfish. A person that loves God and prays and goes to Mass and does um, works of charity for God, um, they will become less selfish. A person that is um, dedicated to their vocation, whether that be the priesthood or the religious life or the married life, um, a, pe a person that is dedicated to their spouse and their children, or their fellow brother priest, or, or monks, or sisters, they will start to, just by love of the other, they will start to rule their passions. Um, it, is, it is this person that has no love for God and no love for neighbor that becomes very selfish and very lonely. And so we see that people that are actually practicing love of God and love of neighbor not only are self, selfless people, sacrificial people, but they also have their passions under control. You will see that they sacrifice themselves all the time, um, and, and, and they have their passions under control. So again, the virtue of faith helps our darkened intellect, the virtue of hope helps our weakened will, and the virtue of charity helps our unruly passions. These theological virtues of faith, hope, and love can be um, seen in the, in the example of the chalice, which is elevated at mass with the precious blood in it. And so faith is the base, hope is the spine, or the stem, I guess you could say, and then charity is the actual uh, cup. And so this is um, kind of how this works. This is a little commentary um, in, in a missal. The chalice itself represents the three theological virtues. Its base symbolizes our being rooted in faith. And so you see there that the base, um, the faith, the anchor. Its stem rises straight upward in hope like a plant seeking the sun of our soul, seeking the heights of heaven. So again, we're able to reach up to heaven because we know we have the forgiveness of our sins and every grace necessary to get to heaven. We, God has not abandoned us. And then finally, the cup of the chalice opens like a flower in full bloom, um, representing the flowering of charity, which is, which is really, we are able to do that because of the gift of the Holy Spirit which, of course, is given to us at baptism. Yes, we will have suffering and labor and death, um, but this starts to point then to the cross and to the Mass. Um, yes, we have physical death, but we have the hope of the resurrection. 
And yes, we have spiritual death, but we have the hope of eternal life, which is, of course, what we profess in the 12th article of the Creed. And so how does this work? Well, I know the reality is that I will suffer and I will have to work hard. Um, but I also know as a Christian that I am united with Jesus Christ. My baptism, I have put on Christ. I am a new creation. And so I connect all of my suffering to the suffering of Jesus Christ on the cross. I connect all of my labor, all of my work, to the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. There is no greater suffering than Jesus Christ on the cross. There is no greater work than his sacrifice on the cross. Where is this cross made present to us? And where are we participating most perfectly in this cross? This, this sacrifice at the Mass. And so it is the obligation of the baptized person who is connected with Christ to sacrifice themselves, their prayer, their work, their joy, their suffering, all of that, um, with in union with Jesus Christ at the cross at every Mass. This is why it's an obligation for the baptized to go to Mass. Um, also, in union with that, um, and, and, and actually with that, my suffering and my work, when connected with Jesus Christ and offered to the Father through Christ, it becomes salvific. Then my suffering and my work somehow mystically brings about the salvation of souls. Again, we don't know how this works, but we leave that up to God. We just know that we have to present our work, our suffering, our prayers, our joys with Jesus, and we know that it will bring about good things. It'll bring about the salvation of souls. Um, then, of course, we hope in the resurrection, um, the resurrection of the body, um, and then we also hope in eternal life, which we profess also in the creed. So right now we have the good news, first column, the bad news, second column, and the good news, the third column. So we don't end there, though, however, with just good news, bad news, good news. Um, there is kind of a, a continuation of the story where we have another bad news. And that would be mortal sin, personal sin. And then we have good news, which is penance, reconciliation, confession. So here we have, if we count, we have the good news, the bad news, the good news, the bad news, the good news. So let's go through this because it's very important and it kind of, it's what makes a distinction between a Catholic and a Protestant, um, especially number four and five. Um, so we start out in column one with the good news. What brings us then into the bad news? Original sin. Okay, what brings us from the bad news, column two, into the good news, column three? Baptism. Pretty much everyone will agree on that. But then we have four and five. So let's explain four and five. Well, we get from column three back into two, going from the good news to the bad news through mortal sin this time, personal sin. So original sin was that sin of Adam. Mortal sin is my own personal sin, which is my own fault. The guilt comes to me. The eternal punishment comes to me. The temporal punishment comes to me. And that really then I lose sanctifying grace. I lose the I lose heaven. Um, and I really give in to my darkened, weakened, uh, darkened intellect, weakened will and unruly passion. And I lose that very charity, love of God and, and also love of neighbor. So I am back now in column two of my own doing, of my own doing, not Adam this time, but me. That is the bad news. But of course, there's the good news of penance, that I can truly have contrition. I, I have sorrow for this um, action and the resolve to not commit this action again. And I confess and I am reconciled, which is the good news. And so I move from that column two into three through penance. And so again, we have the good news, bad news, good news, bad news, good news. We want to always stay in that third column, which would be the state of grace. We want to always keep the one thing necessary, Jesus Christ. We always want him to abide in our soul. Um, we always want to live out those virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And may he always give us the grace necessary to do that. Um, we can kind of end this lesson with a beautiful saying of, of Joan of Arc, who when she was asked at her trial, do you have sanctifying grace within you? She replied, if I do not have sanctifying grace, then let God be so pleased to give it to me. And if I do have sanctifying grace, maybe God be so pleased to keep it within me. Thank you for joining me for this Animode short lesson in which we've covered the Old Testament card circumcision and its fulfillment in the New Testament card baptism. 
We have been particularly looking at the 10th article of the Apostles' Creed, which is the forgiveness of sins. Um, please take the time to um, check out the other lessons on the Animode cards, and please check out our videos on the Animode card games. There is one deck, but five games, and you can check out both the lessons and the card games um, at the links provided. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.